This is a video about Faulkner's A Rose for Emily. In this video, we'll talk about the first few paragraphs of the text. I'll ask you some questions and um, I'll list some of my notes and annotations. And then we'll talk about uh, the ending of the story too. So this has spoilers. Make sure you've read the whole story first. Miss Emily has a really juicy secret, so I don't want you to hear what that secret is for the first time here. Make sure you read the story first. Okay, as we go into the text, let's think about a few questions to, to guide our discussion a little bit. What does the house reveal about Miss Emily and changes in the South? So Gothic literature often takes place in a medieval castle or in a crumbling, creepy estate. Southern Gothic literature often has settings that are really crucial to the plot uh, and also to themes. So Miss Emily's house that she inherits from her father, what does that house say about Emily, her psychology, and also what does the house reveal about the town of Jefferson in general and about people's unwillingness to change. Who is the narrator and is the narrator reliable? Uh, so these are questions to think about as we go into the text. When Miss Emily Grierson died, our whole town went to her funeral. The men, through a sort of respectful affection for a fallen monument, the women, mostly out of curiosity to see the inside of her house, which no one save an old manservant, a combined gardener and cook, had seen in the last 10 years. This opening paragraph gives us a lot of information. The narrator seems to start off with some dichotomies. So we have the reason why men, at least according to the narrator, who may or may not be reliable, why men went to her funeral and why women went to her funeral. So men are going, according to the narrator, because they want to respect what she represents. She, they wanted to respect what she represents. By calling her a fallen monument, it's a little bit dehumanizing. On the one hand, it sounds like a compliment, right? Because a monument is something that stands the test of time, right? Like a, a flag or a statue or a building, all of those things can be a monument. And a monument is always a symbol, right? It symbolizes something. Uh, so on the one hand, it seems very respectful, but it's also establishing that to these people, Miss Emily isn't exactly a human. She isn't exactly someone who's very accessible to them. Uh, already they're keeping her at an arm's length or maybe it's the other way around. So the men are going through this respect and the women are going through this kind of nosy, uh, kind of perverse curiosity to see the inside of her house, to see her things. Now, maybe this is accurate, or maybe we're learning something about the narrator uh, and the narrator's own bias. I think at times in this story, the narrator seems like a man. At other times, the narrator seems like a woman. A woman. Uh, but we can all agree that the narrator frequently says we, so it's a, it seems to be a collective, uh, and that the narrator is not quite quite reliable or not quite someone who we sympathize with, right? After all, the narrator uses offensive language. Uh, so the narrator uh, makes comments that make us realize that the narrator might not just be a stand-in for Faulkner. And by the way, that's true of all stories. The narrator is not the same as the writer himself or herself. So we have this dichotomy between men and women and why they go to her funeral. And then we also have uh, the fact that Miss Emily has a servant. Now, this takes place after the Civil War. This is, um, even though the house was built just a few years after the Civil War in the 1870s, the story takes place after the Civil War, but we know that past is prologue. We know that the legacy of slavery um, is built in or baked into the culture here. So when there's a reference to a manservant, and we later learn the manservant is a black man, um, this might be hinting at the legacy of slavery. It also tells us something about a change to their status, to Miss Emily and the Grierson status. The fact that they have a combined servant, both a gardener and cook, suggests that maybe their circumstances have been reduced a little bit. Okay, uh, let's talk about the house. So you might notice that the house is described as being kind of beautiful, but in a state of disrepair. So it's a big squarish frame house that had once been white, decorated with cupolas, inspired and scrolled balconies. So even though it's crumbling, uh, and even though there's a horrible stench, at least at one point, there's a horrible stench uh, emanating from the house, uh, it's really beautiful uh, and intricate and ornate. Uh, a cupola 
is like a dome structure that you might see on the top of a barn or on the top of a house. It's really to ventilate and add in light, but oftentimes it's very decorative. Uh, and the house had scrolled balconies inspired. So this is a detailed house, a house that in its heyday when it was built in the 1870s would have been quite beautiful. But now we know that uh, the house has become um, not only dirty and dusty, uh, but the area around the house has transformed. And again, we realize here that the narrator isn't totally neutral in his description. The narrator is casting a lot of aspersions by saying that the neighborhood now uh, is an eyesore and that her house in its state of disrepair is an eyesore among eyesores. So it's almost as if we're learning that the narrator um, doesn't necessarily like all of the changes to the economy and all of the, the changes to the neighborhood that have taken place. I noticed that had once been is repeated and generally when writers repeat things we want to pay attention. So it had once been white. It had once been our most select street. Uh, there's a lot of past tense in this story. Uh, on the one hand, we get a, a really keen sense of time. Not only does Miss Emily have the pocket wash, not only does her hair turn gray, we have all these markers of time, but we also have stagnant time, time that's sort of standing still. She has the pocket watch, but the people who come into the house can't can't see it. It's behind her dress or it's in her dress. They only hear the ticking. Uh, her house has aged a lot, but nobody's been in there for several years, at least at one point in the story. So we have a lot of references to time, but also a lot of references to time standing still. Um, what I think is really noteworthy is that the house is described as um, being built in a heavily lightsome style. So lightsome means kind of an airy and bright style, but it's heavily lightsome. This is an example of an oxymoron. So an oxymoron is when you have two uh, seemingly contradictory words put right together, like sweet sorrow or cruel kindness. I wouldn't say this is a perfect oxymoron because they're not exactly opposites, but they're, they're contradictory words, heavily lightsome. So on the one hand, it sounds as if the house is overly ornate, almost maybe even gaudy, a little bit too detailed, a little bit too flowery, a little bit too ornate. Uh, but it also conveys just that really nice contrast between something kind of dark or something heavy and something light and airy. I think already we have the sense that this house might have been beautiful at one point, but that maybe it's covering up something much more sinister, much more disturbing. So think about this idea, because I think it recurs throughout the text of something gilded or something beautiful uh, trying to cover up the stench, literally or metaphorically, of something else. Not only in terms of Miss Emily's house, but also in terms of the society of the, so the South uh, and also um, how the South was built. We know that the South was built upon slavery. So now garages and cotton gins had encroached and obliterated even the August or grand names of that neighborhood. And only Miss Emily's house was left, lifting its stubborn and coquettish decay above the cotton wags wagons and gasoline pumps, an eyesore among eyesores. So here's what I mean when I'm talking about contrast here. Coquettish decay. A coquette is a flirt. And when you think of something decaying, you think of the opposite of something youthful and flirtatious. So that's sort of an oxymoron there too. And I think there's something really revolting about that uh, because it's it's simultaneously like flirtatious and ornate and pretty and rose colored, but there's something decaying. There's something rotten underneath it, which I think makes it all the more disturbing and, and grotesque. And we realize that the whole economy has changed. This neighborhood that once used to be a neighborhood where people uh, of importance lived uh, is now much more industrial. So we get some information about how the economy of the South has changed and also how the narrator feels about that. So now Miss Emily has died, but the narrator doesn't just say Miss Emily has died. Uh, the narrator uses sort of a euphemism. Now she's gone to join the representatives of those August names where they lay in the Cedar Bemuse Cemetery among the ranked and anonymous graves of Union and Confederate soldiers who fell at the Battle of Jefferson. So it's kind of a fancy way of saying uh, that she's dead and she's been buried with Union and Confederate soldiers. Kind of interesting, we have more contrasts here, ranked and anonymous, right? The graves of people who uh, people would know, generals, and anonymous 
soldiers. And then we have Union and Confederate soldiers. So we have all of these contrasts, but they're all in the same cemetery. That's kind of worth noting. And I also think the fact that the narrator doesn't flat out say death in this paragraph, although in the first paragraph the, narr the narrator does, is telling. I want to look at the syntax of this line here. Alive, Miss Emily had been a tradition, a duty, and a care, a sort of hereditary obligation upon the town. Okay, so uh, tradition, duty, and care, maybe uh, that's just the way that Faulkner chose to write it, using the words in that order, but let's think about why he might have put tradition first, then duty, then care. When I look at this, to me, tradition seems kind of societal and broader, right? Traditions are something that aren't just carried on by one person or one family or one town, but by a whole group of people. And then a duty can be something that a whole family feels obligated to do. And a care somehow to me seems much more specific, like caring for one specific um, loved one. What do you think? Am I making too much of the syntax there, going from like the societal to the specific? Or do you agree with me that this syntax tax might be zooming in uh, on Miss Emily and how people feel about Miss Emily. Also, do you think that you can inherit a sense of obligation? Can you inherit guilt? Can you inherit obligation? I think you can, not literally, of course. Uh, but what does that mean, that they inherit this obligation? We know that uh, the younger generation, they're not really happy with this arrangement where Emily doesn't have to pay taxes because of some lie. We'll talk about that in a second. But there is still this inherited or inborn sense that Miss Emily isn't just a person, that she represents something, uh, not just her. Let's talk about Colonel Sartoris. So he has two different sets of rules for different people. He fathers the edict, and that word fathered is really interesting. It doesn't just say he wrote a proclamation or he invented a rule, but he fathers the edict that if you are an African American woman, you cannot be seen in town without your apron. But then when it comes to Miss Emily, a white woman whose family was someone important, her father and the Griersons were considered important, he's willing to create um, all sorts of privileges and bend the rules, uh, all while not making her feel guilty, right? By not making her feel like a charity case. So he has two totally different sets of rules and expectations for white women versus black women. So he remits her taxes or cancels her taxes uh, and he cancels them from the death of her father on into perpetuity, so on forever. Not that Miss Emily would have accepted charity. So obviously pride is a big deal uh, to people in this town. And Miss Emily has a lot of pride and that might be part of um, her decision later on in the story to buy rat poison, which we can assume she uses to kill Homer Baron, who jilts her. Um, she obviously has a lot of pride. Now, she doesn't seem stupid to me, uh, but she continues to play along um, with this dispensation of her taxes. Let's look at the very last line of that. Only a man of Colonel Sartoris's generation and thought could have invented it. That is this really elaborate story that this is how her father loaned money to the town and how the town prefers to pay him back. And only a woman could have believed it. So again, we get the sense that the narrator has um, certain um, prejudices. Uh, and one of them is a belief that women are either gullible or willing to believe something so ridiculous, or maybe if we're going to give a more charitable uh, outlook on this, that they just don't really understand or care about taxes. Uh, but we also learn that the narrator seems to be either frustrated or aware of the fact that Colonel Sartoris's generation uh, is outdated, that uh, only someone of his generation would come up with something this ridiculous uh, because only someone of that generation understands the culture of pride um, and also maybe understands Miss Emily's predicament. She can't very well make a whole lot of money. Her China painting lessons are not gonna provide a whole lot of money. She is unmarried, um, so it might be difficult for her to pay taxes. But of course, we know that it's not just that he's a nice guy because he has two totally separate sets of standards uh, for different people of different colors. Okay, so when we get down to the next paragraph, uh, we learn about how um, the younger people, the younger mayors and aldermen are trying to uh, get Miss Emily to pay her taxes, right? Fair enough. And uh, a week later, the mayor, mayor wrote to her himself, offering to call or send his car for her. Pretty nice, right? Uh, they're not saying she's gonna get locked up. They're saying, let us help you pay your taxes. 
and received a reply note on paper in an archaic or old-fashioned shape in a thin, flowing calligraphy in faded ink to the effect that she no longer went out at all. The tax notice was also enclosed without comment. So even her stationery itself, kind of like the house, is archaic and old-fashioned. The calligraphy is flowery and flowing and detailed, kind of like the house. Uh, and instead of um, actually uh, saying that she won't pay the taxes, she simply encloses the tax notice. Uh, stationery comes up a few times in this story. Think about what stationery represents uh, and also think about the word stationery, right? Something that stands still, that does doesn't change, that doesn't transform. We know that her house, the society around her, there are all sorts of changes going on around her, and yet Miss Emily is staying the same, minus also some big changes to her appearance and also the appearance of the house. Okay. Um, they called a special meeting of the Board of Aldermen. A deputation or a committee or delegation waited upon her, knocked at the door through which no visitor had passed since she ceased giving China painting lessons eight or ten years earlier. Okay, so we learn from this that uh, no one has entered her house and that she used to give China painting lessons, which is something that's very um, kind of quintessentially feminine. Uh, also, when you think about what China represents, it's something kind of old fashioned and uh, brittle and breakable, and it, it doesn't have a whole lot of use, at least China painting lessons, um, beautiful as they might be, uh, doesn't have a whole lot of practical um, use, uh, and people no longer want to take her China painting lessons. So we learn about um, her hobbies uh, and also uh, that nobody has been through the house. We also know that her servant um, is the one who let them in. And we learn at the end of the story, once, they, once the narrator walks in uh, and they see what's in Miss Emily's bedchamber, uh, that the Toby, the uh, servant, leaves and is never heard from again. Who can blame him? There's all these references to dust. So it says the leather was cracked when they sat down, faint dust rose sluggishly about their thighs, spinning with slow motes in the single sun ray. I think that's a really beautiful and vivid image of something that has a little bit of sunshine or a little bit of light coming through, but it's so stagnant in there that you can see the particles of dust. A moat is just a little particle of something. And then we have on a tarnished gilt easel before the fireplace did a crayon portrait of Miss Emily's father. So there are all sorts of Freudian interpretations about what's going on with Miss Emily and her father. One theory is that Miss Emily's father is just abusive. Uh, one theory is that they have had an incestuous and abusive relationship. Another is just that he uh, scared away all the men that were ever interested in her uh, because he wanted someone to, you know, pick up after him and clean up the house. Uh, we know that Miss Emily is unwilling to depart with her father's body for three days, uh, but who can blame her, right? She's dealing with death um, for the first time, or significant death for the first time. Uh, but it's also a foreshadowing of what's going to come later uh, with Homer Barron. The fact that on the fireplace is a portrait of her father suggests not only whose house it is, but that he looms large even after he's gone. Uh, maybe he's messed up her chances of marriage and happiness. We know for a woman in this time period uh, and with her level of pride, there weren't a whole lot of other options for making money uh, and, have, and being seen as respectable in society. Uh, when she goes to buy the rat poison to Homer to kill Homer Baron, uh, the town just assumes that she will kill herself, and they think it's probably for the best that she'll kill them, kill herself. So that reveals so much about how they view a woman's role. Uh, a woman who is over thirty and jilted to them might as well kill herself uh, because she's a disgrace. Keep in mind, nobody tries to reach out to help her. Uh, people even think that would kind of be better. Um, and if they believe that she's going to kill someone else, they don't do anything about it except for right for rats and rat might be a reference to literal rats although we know what she's using it for or it might reveal that homer baron himself is a kind of rat if he promised himself to her but then uh jilted her ultimately um at the end of the story when uh they enter her house after she's died and then they enter her bedchamber and they see what they see there which is Homer Baron's skeleton rotting into her bed and then they see a single strand of iron gray hair on the pillow next to him 
Do you think they know what they're going to see? I think they do to a certain extent. At one point, her house weaked and they had to sprinkle lime around the house. Another example of putting something kind of pretty uh, or putting something kind of benign over something that's rotting or grotesque or horrid, whether it's the stench of a rotting body or the stench of slavery, whatever it is, putting something kind of pretty over it. We can even say that um, calling Miss Emily a type of icon or monument or giving her this special deal, that even though things, gestures like those are putting something sort of pretty over something horrific, that they're actually not all that nice uh, because they force her to live in this isolated house by herself and to remain not a real human that they interact with and have compassion for, but an idol or a symbol or an icon of the past. So do they know what they're going to see? I think they kind of do. In fact, um, there's understatement at the end. I think it says something like, on the bed lay the man. Uh, and there isn't a whole lot of shock. Uh, I don't know that they expect to see the gray hair on the pillow next to him. You can interpret that how you want to. Uh, obviously, she has been uh, snuggling with this body or doing more with this body. Um, this is her bridal chamber. So she bought um, all the accessories that you would buy um, if you are planning on getting married, uh, you see the rose colored curtain. So this is her kind of most intimate space upon which is a rotting corpse of the man who jilted her. Uh, and she continues to um, interact with it in some way, however you want to interpret that. So what does Homer Baron represent? Does he just represent the past? Uh, could he represent her failed ambitions or her failed hopes? Uh, could he represent the North? What What's going on with Homer Baron? And that's one other big contrast uh, that we haven't talked about yet, but Homer Baron is a Northerner and he's not quite of Miss Emily's status, at least not Miss Emily's status when she was younger and had more status. He's someone who overlooks or oversees laborers. So um, he is sort of more of a working class person than Miss Emily is and he's from the North. Miss Emily is from the South and she doesn't know anything about hard work or labor. Um, so they're pretty different in terms of uh, not only where they come from, but also their social class. We have more dichotomies there. Some people believe that uh, Homer Baron is gay. There's a reference to him uh, drinking with younger men at the Elks Lodge. Uh, it could very well be that it would have been a marriage of convenience. He was gay in a time when you're not allowed to um, express those that love. And uh, she was a woman over 30 at a time when that would have been taboo for many women too. Other people think he was just not ready to marry Miss Emily, that maybe her cousins uh, kind of scared him away. But for whatever reason, he does choose to visit her one more time and then he has never seen uh, or heard from again. So what do you think Homer Baron represents? And then I think my last question will be, are the townspeople complicit? So on a literal level, or if we were trying this in a courtroom, no, right? They don't um, They don't encourage her to murder Homer Baron. Uh, they don't, they do supply her with the murder weapon, but it's under the guise of it being rat poison, right? Because she, apparently has a rat problem, but not really. Uh, but are they complicit in some other way? Uh, their treatment of Miss Emily, their isolation of Miss Emily, uh, their, their thought that she should just end her life uh, if it's not going a certain way. Uh, how they bend over backwards to adjust the rules for her or to not say things to her face, right? Uh, to kind of put on a pretty facade, to sugarcoat everything and to not have a direct conversation with her. Uh, when, they, when they smell the stench coming from her house, do they have some suspicion of what is inside of her house, but they're unwilling to acknowledge it, perhaps because it will re reveal something not just about her, but reveal something about their town, about the South, or about themselves. Uh, I really look forward to hearing your thoughts on the first couple of passages and on the questions that I ask you on the next page.